Well, hello and welcome to the first of a series of videos we're doing, which we're calling Straight to Video, and they're a chance to have a look at some of the works we have in store here at the VGM that haven't been on display for quite some time. Today we're having a look at this work, we're here in my office, got this work out of store. We're having a look at this work, which is uh, by an artist called Edward Irvin Halliday. Uh, and it's a sketch for a much bigger work that he made. It's called The Story of Marcius. We, we know it's a sketch, or one of the reasons we know it's a sketch is if you can, I don't know whether you can see this on the video, but it, you can see it quite clearly in the skyline here. The work has been gridded out by the artist. And this was, um, it's a fairly standard device if you want to scale a work up from small to large, so that you can then try and work out what you put in what square on a larger scale. So we're going to talk a bit today about who Edward Halliday was, why this work was made. We're also going to look at some of the story contained within this work, because it's a very good example of um, a narrative painting. So Edward Halliday was born in 1902 in Liverpool. He went to the Liverpool Institute uh, and later spent a few years at Liverpool College. His father was an accountant and, and he really wanted him to be an accountant, but um, Edward was much more interested in art and uh, he managed to persuade his father to let him join the Liverpool School of Art in 1920, where uh, he spent a couple of years. Um, and from the Liverpool School of Art, he went to the Royal College of Art, where he was taught by William Rothenstein. And in this period, in the 1920s and 30s, um, some of the leading painters in Britain uh, leading young painters emerging in their careers um, competed against each other to receive scholarships to join the British School at Rome and uh, Halliday was successful in winning one of these. This enabled him to spend a couple of years in Rome at the British schools and travelling around Italy. Um, it's all paid for and it was really a great opportunity to learn more about Italian art um, and work, I suppose, uninterrupted, you know, away from the United Kingdom. When he'd been at the uh, Liverpool School of Art, he'd already started to uh, generate some contacts for people who might commission him to make um, work for them. And one of the key people was a man called Sir Benjamin Johnson. He was um, head of um, a very famous Liverpool company, which we now know as Johnson's The Cleaners. And uh, he'd already commissioned Edward Halliday to make a couple of works for him, uh, one of which is actually now in this collection as well. It's called St Paul Meeting Lydia. This was a work that he made for Johnson's boardroom in Bootle, um, St Lydia being the patron saint of dyers and weavers, so the most appropriate person for a cleaning company. He also made a very fine work uh, called Hypnos for Johnson's home in Walton. Well, um, in 1928, between mid-1928 and mid-1929, Sir Benjamin was president of a club in Liverpool called the Athenaeum, which was a private member, it still exists, private members club, and it had very recently had to move from its original premises, uh, which was opened in the late 18th century, to a new series of rooms on Church Alley, which is just opposite the Blue Coat, what's now the Blue Coat Arts Centre, in the middle of town. And they had a new library, which uh, was designed especially for them in this building. And Halliday was commissioned 
to make a series of three very large scale panels for the library which were all related to stories in the life of the Greek goddess Athena after whom the Athenaeum was named. And this is a sketch for one of the panels that he made. It's called The Story of Marcius. Um, so I'll explain a little bit about um, this story, where it, where it came from, and then we'll talk a little bit about the painting. The Story of Marcius appears in quite a lot of classical texts, but the most um, famous one, really, is in Book 6 of Ovid, the Metamorphoses, um, starting at line 382. And this is from the Penguin edition I'm about to read to you, translated by David Rayburn. Um, it's not a terribly nice story, so um, if you're potentially offended, look away now. Um, after the Theban had told this story about the demise of the Lycian peasants, another recalled the horrible punishment dealt to the satyr who challenged Latona's son to a piping contest and lost. Don't rip me away from myself, he entreated. I'm sorry, he shouted between his shrieks. Don't flay me for piping. In spite of his cries, the skin was peeled from his flesh and his body was turned into one great wound. The blood was pouring all over him. Muscles were fully exposed his uncovered veins convulsively quivered, and the palpitating intestines could well be counted, and so could the organs glistening through the wall of his chest. The piper was mourned by the rustic fauns who watched, watched over the woodlands, his brother Satyrs, the nymphs, and Olympus, the pupil he loved, by all who tended their flocks or herds on the Lycian mountains. Their tears dropped down and saturated the fertile earth, who absorbed them deep in her veins and discharged them back into the air in the form of a spring. This found its way to the sea through a channel which took the name of Marcius, clearest of the Phrygian rivers. So you might wonder how all that really relates to Athena and why this was, because it's rather a gruesome story and why this was you know, an appropriate um, subject for the Athenaeum Library. Well, looking at the sketch, we can start to work out a little bit more of the story, a bit more than Ovid tells us there. Um, so first of all, we can look at this figure here and we can tell from her helmet that this is the goddess Athena. Now Athena was, um, according to Greek mythology, the daughter of Zeus, and um, she had a number of attributes very associated with um, the arts, really, um, and obviously the patron goddess of Athens. Um, and in rather a nice touch, and you don't really get this from the sketch, but in, in the full scale panel, um, a, a picture of which you can find on our, our blog. Um, th these trees here, I'm pretty sure are olive trees, and um, the olive tree was Athena's gift to the, um, the city of Athens, according to legend. So. Um, it's a classic symbol of Athena. In, in part of the story that happens before Ovid tells us about the death of Marcius, Athena finds a pair of pipes um, called Iolus, and you can see uh, in this bit here, the figure of Marcius is playing a pair of double pipes. And she tried playing them, uh, according to legend, but um, she didn't like the way they made her look because she had to puff her cheeks out to blow into the pipes. And um, various people laughed at her, um, which rather upset her, so she threw them away. 
and they were found by a satyr called Marcius. Now satyrs were woodland spirits uh, associated with the god Bacchus, uh, uh, or Dionysius to give him his Greek name. And you can see here, here's a picture of um, this particular satyr, Marcius, in the foreground. And they always have very classic uh, symbols, really, to show what they are. So they have donkey's ears, you can just see his pointed ears. And they're usually shown with quite a pointed beard. Um, and you can just see here, he's got a tail coming out from behind him. And um, Marcius picked up these pipes and decided to play them. And because they'd recently been played by a goddess, they were sort of enchanted pipes. And he was able to make very, very beautiful music with them. Um, and th at this point, the sources, th there's some disagreement about what happened next. According to some sources, Marcius challenged the god Apollo to a music contest. And in some sources, it's vice versa, and Apollo challenges Marcius. I think it's more standard to believe that Marcius challenged Apollo. And we see the god Apollo, this figure here, sort of quite nicely counterpoised against Athena. The god Apollo, uh, another of the sort of top-ranking Greek gods, uh, associated very much with music, and you can see his uh, he has one of his classic symbols here in the painting, which is a lyre. And I suppose, um, in some ways, one can read this whole myth as, a, as, as an examination of two different types of music. Music made by blown instruments and music made by stringed instruments. So. Um, Marcius and Apollo have a, a musical contest and um, it is judged by the muses. Now there were nine muses, uh, Greek muses, who um, sort of goddesses who I I embodied certain aspects of things like music, poetry, um, performance arts generally. Halliday chooses to show three of them in this little bit of the painting here. And here's Marcius playing for the muses. This could be amused here too, so maybe there's four, one of them banging a tambourine. Um, now perhaps rather inevitably, because Marcius was actually competing against a god, he didn't win. And as we've heard in Ovid, um, the, 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 the outcut, whoever won, was allowed to do whatever they wanted to the loser. And Apollo chose to have Marcius tied to a tree and flayed alive. And um, again, you, you're not getting all these details in the sketch because Halliday developed some of this as he made the bigger work. but. The figure here, which is shown just as a, a semi-naked man holding a knife, is a symbol of Marcius's impending doom. Um, in the finished work, this figure is shown wearing um, a black kind of hood and cape to give him even more of a menacing aspect. It looks even better in the finished work. You'll remember in, the, in Ovid, that I read to you, um, there was talk of the generation of a spring and a river. And again, Halliday includes this idea. Um, you can see the spring right here in the foreground. So we have Marcius opposite the symbol of his impending death. And then in between them, what results from that death? This spring that creates a river that bears Marcius's name. Um, I mentioned that a few things change in, in the finished work. Um, there's a number of other things I'll point out to you. Um, this figure, well, the, the, the work widens a little. 
so he doesn't quite directly scale up edge to edge and you get a little bit more detail on this side and this becomes a full figure here. He changes the direction of this figure in the background to face that way which actually pushes more of the visual impact of the work into the centre and really felt that that was slightly jarring in the sketch and he completely changes the setup of the mountains to make them even more stepped than they are. And one of the things that we can see coming through this work, which really follows on probably from his experiences in Italy, um, and seeing a lot of early Renaissance and, and pre-Renaissance paintings when he was there, is the influence of creating a very stepped visual um, landscape. So, and, and this allows him to create quite dramatic effects within the painting and put little elements of the, of the story uh, against quite a steep vertical backdrop. Um, this is one set of, uh, this is one sketch for one of the panels. Um, the, this work, the, the finished work, and the other two panels are still in the Athenaeum Library. Um, and th th this represented sort of the, the high point of, of really, of um, a series of narrative works that Halliday made up to about 1930. Following on from this, his interest took him more in the direction of portraiture. You can see in this work that there's a lot of interest in the figure, and he did state that really drawing painting figures, human figures, was much more important to him than um, drawing and painting other things, and, and all the other things are really just forming a backdrop to the figures. Um, he was very, very successful as a portrait painter, and he made a, a great number of portraits of famous people, including a significant number um, of Queen Elizabeth, um, both when she was princess and after her coronation. And if you go to the BBC Our Paintings website and search for Edward Halliday, you see about 79 works that are in public collections across the UK. You can view them all as a slideshow. Um, and you will see um, the, um, some of the royal portraits in that set. So. Um, that's what I want to say about this work. Um, I hope you've enjoyed um, hearing a little bit more about it. And you should keep uh, looking at our, web, uh, our YouTube channel for further straight to video um, presentations that we'll be doing over the next few months. Thank you.